Okay, hello everybody. It's time to start. Hopefully everyone has their cameras on and is ready, all the presenters. Welcome to tonight's event. My name is Becky McIntyre and my pronouns are she, her. I'm a proud supporter of the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society. I'm very glad to be here with you. Welcome to our first lecture of the season. I'm delighted to extend a warm and heartfelt welcome to the esteemed co-chairs of the Women's Society. They will be joining us today to introduce the upcoming lecture and share more about the society's deep passion for supporting women's health care. Welcome to Between Us. We're so happy you're here. My name is Rhiannon Adams and my pronouns are she, her. My name is Vanessa Lancaster and my pronouns are she, her. We're excited to be here as co-chairs of the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society. The Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society welcomes community volunteers from all walks of life to join us as we break down barriers and raise awareness and funds for Alberta's only dedicated women's hospital. A hospital that provides such specialized care as high-risk paternal care, minimally invasive surgeries, and treatment of women's cancers. Since our founding in 2017, the Women's Society has raised close to a million dollars in support of the Lois Hole Hospital for Women. Our hospital proudly cares for women in all ages and stages of life, from a land mass covering a third of Canada and we are proud to support it. Your presence and support today helps make all of this possible. Thank you. Formerly known as What The Health, we debuted a new brand this year, renaming this engaging speaker series, Between Us, Exploring the Mind and Body. Most often conversations that start with just between us come from a place of trust. This rebrand represents the essence of trust, where intimate and less openly discussed subjects like personal health matters find a safe space for discussion. We aspire for this new name to reflect the depth of honesty, intimacy, and expert insight shared during these talks by the speakers who join us. Following the event, we'll be sending out a survey via email seeking your valuable feedback. Every participant who completes the survey will be entered into a draw for a chance to win a $25 gift card, courtesy of Alberta Blue Cross. A heartfelt appreciation goes out to Alberta Blue Cross for their steadfast support as presenting sponsor, enabling us to host this informative series. Please join me and Rhiannon in extending a warm welcome to Alberta Blue Cross for the land acknowledgement. Hi everyone, my name is Nursa Kanji. I'm the Director of Community Impact at Alberta Blue Cross, and I wanna welcome you all to today's session. Alberta Blue Cross has been a proud supporter of this barrier-free and inclusive lecture series for the past five years. We're thrilled to continue our partnership with the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society and support their goal in creating a safe space for honest discussion around women's health. So thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Before we get started, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. Today and every day, we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6 territory. We recognize that the city of Edmonton and us, the people here, are beneficiaries of this peace and friendship treaty. Treaty 6 encompasses the traditional territories of numerous Western Canada First Nations, such as the Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakoto Sioux. We're taking this important moment here today to acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Thank you. Thank you, Narasan. Thank you, Blue Cross. And I'm so sorry if I started the video again while you were talking. Technical uh, learnings for me. Uh, but I am so happy to now introduce our speaker for tonight. Dr. Shazma Mathani is an emergency room doctor at the Royal Alexander Hospital and the Stollery Children's Hospital. She is passionate about health education and protecting public and accessible health care. When not working, she enjoys tennis, ultimate frisbee, and exploring Edmonton's many coffee shops and restaurants. 
So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mathani to our presentation tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Becky, and thanks to everybody um, for attending tonight. Uh, it's uh, it's weird to be on the other side of a screen here. Normally, I like to just like have um, the between us type conversations one to one, but uh, hopefully this um, uh, will be informative for you. And then after the presentation, there'll be lots of time for questions and and discussion in terms of anything that comes up. All right, so. Um, before we start, it is really important for me to mention uh, that everything that is discussed here, of course, cannot replace the conversation and consultation with your own healthcare provider. Everything uh, here is for informational purposes only. Um, and my, my mission here and also on my social media platforms is to really just keep uh, all of you armed with information uh, and education on many different health topics and today specifically on the topic of urinary tract infections in the context of women's health. And so, of course, this is not considered medical advice. So let's start by what is the urinary tract. So the urinary tract is more than just the bladder. Um, when people hear a urinary tract infection, oftentimes they may think that it's just simply a bladder infection, but the urinary tract is much broader than that. So it's this group of organs that processes and handles urine. And so when we start with the kidneys, that is what filters all of the blood um, through them and pulls out any sort of salts, uh, different toxins, and then concentrates them into uh, urine. It then sends them down the ureters, which are, so, which are those two tubes that you see there. And then that urine gets stored in the bladder until it's full enough to have that sensation to pee. And then the bladder empties through the urethra, which is what brings the pee outside of the body. So that entire uh, constellation of organs there, the, the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra are all considered the urinary tract together. And any part of that urinary tract can become infected. But the two main things that we're going to talk about today are the kidneys and the bladder in terms of things that can get infected. So a UTI is a broad category or a broad name for an infection of either the kidneys or the bladder. And so what it technically means is an overgrowth of bacteria and symptoms associated with that. So you can have sometimes an imbalance or overgrowth of bacteria, but it doesn't typically get diagnosed as an infection unless there are symptoms associated with that. A bladder infection is called cystitis, and these are much, much more common and much more easily treated than kidney infections. So a kidney infection is called pyelonephritis, and that can be much more serious because those kidney infections can actually spread to the rest of the body and into the bloodstream and can be very serious. Now you can see in that picture there, those little green things are bacteria. And so the usual bacterial infection that causes a bladder infection and a kidney infection is the the bacteria called E. coli. And so that is a bacteria that lives around the gastrointestinal tract. And so that bacteria can travel from the gastrointestinal tracts around your bum into the urethra and then move up the urethra into the bladder and cause an infection in that area. There can also be situations where bacteria from the surrounding skin in the vulvar area can cause um, uh, a bacterial overgrowth and cause a bladder infection as well. Now, um, when those bacteria actually move up higher, so if they travel up those two ureters into one or both of the kidneys, that's when we can get a kidney infection. And that has a, a very different set of symptoms that we're going to get into. Um, and like I said, can be much more serious because if they are not treated appropriately, they can spread throughout the blood and lead to something called sepsis, which can be life-threatening. So in terms of the symptoms of a UTI, of course, it depends on whether it's a bladder infection or a kidney infection. So the typical symptoms that most people usually think about with the, are, are what they think about when there's a bladder infection. So that typical burning or pain when peeing, um, having pain kind of over that bladder area, so just in that lower part of the pelvis, needing to pee a lot more often than usual, so feeling like you have to run to the bathroom all the time, and having this sense of urgency of needing to get to the bathroom uh, very, very quickly, um, often having a sensation that your bladder is not emptying completely. Um, and when you do have to end up going to the bathroom, there's not really a lot of uh, urine in the bladder to actually empty out. But that sensation and that urge is still there even when the bladder is empty. Sometimes there can be blood in the urine and that can be either uh, kind of pinkish urine or red urine. And then sometimes the urine can have a, a different smell to it as well because of that change and that growth in bacteria that's leading to that infection. Now in older women, the symptoms can be a lot more subtle. So they may not have those classic symptoms of the burning, 
um, and then needing to go very frequently and needing to get to the bathroom right away. They may just have things like urinary incontinence uh, that is new or unusual or just generally feeling unwell. And so that's important to keep in mind because different populations and different age groups can present quite differently when it comes to bladder infections. On the flip side, when we talk about a kidney infection, it often is associated with more um, what we call systemic symptoms, so symptoms in the rest of the body as well. And so there can be a fever associated with a kidney infection. And then there's usually pain in the back. And so the kidneys live kind of in that um, mid back area. And usually it's on one side. It's pretty rare unless you have an underlying uh, medical condition to have a, bi a kidney infection on both sides. And so it's usually pain on one side of the back. There can be nausea and vomiting associated with kidney infections as well. And just this general feeling of feeling unwell, you can have kind of some muscle aches and, and kind of what we call flu-like symptoms because that um, the, once the infection spreads to the kidney, it can start pretty quickly spreading um, and causing symptoms to the rest of the body. And so that's why it's important to recognize those symptoms early and see a doctor if you're concerned about that. So there are some potential complications of a UTI. And so I mentioned some of these things before. These complications are very unlikely with just what we call a simple, uncomplicated UTI. So someone who doesn't really get um, bladder infections very frequently, the infection is kind of localized to the bladder and that lower part of the urinary tract, it's very unlikely that from the bladder, um, these complications are going to happen. It's usually a lot more likely if that infection travels up to one or both of the kidneys. And so um, once that kidney gets infected, that bacteria can spread to the blood and lead to something called sepsis, which can cause a whole kind of general inflammatory response in the body. It can make the blood pressure very low. It can make someone very, very sick and need to be admitted to hospital and monitored very, very closely. Anytime there's a kidney infection, it usually needs IV antibiotics, not just oral antibiotics. And I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. It can also lead to a change in your kidney function um, over the long term, because if you have recurrent kidney infections, it can actually cause some scarring to the kidneys and change that kidney function over the long term. And in uh, more rare cases, we can, uh, people can develop what's called a kidney abscess. And so an abscess is essentially just a collection of pus. Um, and so that can actually happen in the kidneys as well and present with similar symptoms to a kidney infection with, uh, with pain and fever. And that's usually diagnosed by getting some pictures in the emergency department to look specifically at the kidneys and see that there is an abscess that's there. Now, there are some populations that are a lot more prone to complications of a kidney or bladder infection. And so people who are diabetic, um, older adults, uh, anyone who's immunocompromised, Anyone who has um, kind of a, an underlying structural abnormality, like some sort of like narrowing along the, um, along the urinary tract, um, anyone that has a kidney stone that also has an infection, those are all kind of risk factors for potential complications of, um, of the urinary tract infections. Now, when it comes to a diagnosis of a kidney infection, Usually the classic symptoms, so that burning, that urgency, having to go to the bathroom more frequently, having some blood in your urine, those classic symptoms of cystitis or a bladder infection usually indicate a very high probability of diagnosis of a urinary tract or a bladder infection. So if you're in a situation where you're completely otherwise healthy, you don't have any sort of complicating features, um, any sort of risk factors for a more severe infection, you may not actually need a urine test when you see your doctor they may um, decide based on symptoms alone and being, on, being an otherwise healthy person that it's actually okay to just treat you with antibiotics for your urinary tract infection. Now, if there are any sort of complicating features though, that isn't always the case. So if you're someone that has um, previously had a urinary tract infection that's had kind of known resistant bacteria, if you're someone that gets recurrent or frequent UTIs, if you're someone that might've used antibiotics recently because that may change the bacteria that are growing in your bladder, um, if you're someone who is an older adult um, or any sort of kind of structural abnormalities um, or kidney problems, that's someone that usually would need a, a urine test and a urine culture to diagnose the UTI. So there's two different types of urine tests. One is what we call a urinalysis. And what that does, it's, um, it's a, a test where you basically get told that there are certain markers in there. Um, so certain kind of chemicals that bacteria can make. Um, and white blood cells that we can detect in this test. 
that show that those are signs of a urinary tract infection. So that usually comes back if you come to the emergency department or go to your family doctor, um, that usually comes back fairly quickly. And so the diagnosis based on that urinalysis can be pretty quick. But after that, the urine is sent for a culture as well. And so that then gets sent to a microbiology lab where the urine um, is kind of essentially looked, uh, looked at to see what bacteria grow in it. So that bacteria is then identified. And once that bacteria is identified, it gets tested against a standard panel of antibiotics to make sure that there is not a resistant bacteria that's there, um, that there's no kind of unexpected um, uh, features of this bacteria where it's not going to be treated with the usual um, kind of standard antibiotics that we use for urinary tract infections. And so um, in those situations, if there is, uh, if your doctor finds that um, there is a bacteria that is not um, going to be treated by the antibiotic that you're on, it means that you have to be changed to a different antibiotic. And so that's where that culture becomes really important uh, to kind of look to see how many bacteria there are, what type of bacteria it is, and what antibiotics are going to work for that specific bacteria that's growing uh, for that, that urinary tract infection. So there are some people that are much more prone to urinary tract infections. Now, females in general are a lot more prone to urinary tract infections. So if we go back to this slide, you can see here that the urethra in females is quite short. And that is something that makes uh, females in particular a lot more prone to urinary tract infections because the distance between uh, the bum, which is where a lot of the bacteria come from, to the bladder is one to two centimeters at the most, whereas in males, their urethra can be several centimeters long, and it just takes, uh, it, it's a, a lot more challenging for bacteria to travel up there and not just be kind of flushed away um, with, with urination in males. And so females in particular are a lot more prone to uh, bladder infections and kidney infections as well, especially as they get older. And I'm going to come back to that in a second here. People who are pregnant are also a lot more prone to urinary tract infections. And that has to do um, with the things like the bladder not emptying completely. And that can lead to uh, bacteria having a much more um, favorable environment to grow. There are also changes to um, the pH of the vagina and kind of the vulvar area uh, in pregnancy that can also lead to changes in bacteria and overgrowth of um, bad bacteria versus good bacteria. Anyone who has an indwelling urinary catheter. And so the reason for that is when there's any sort of um, kind of non-tissue uh, uh, catheter or any sort of non-tissue medical device that's in place, it acts as kind of this uh, foreign, uh, foreign body uh, that can lead to making it easier for bacteria to kind of cling on to that catheter but also it kind of holds the urethra open and so it can actually make it easier for those bacteria to travel up to the bladder as well. And so anyone that has a urinary, uh, urinary catheter is at increased risk of a urinary tract infection. And then as I mentioned previously, any sort of urinary structural abnormalities. So if it's someone that has any sort of um, pinches or what we call strictures along the way, it can make it difficult or more challenging for the urine to kind of empty more regularly. Um, if there's kind of, if there's a stone that's, um, uh, that's either in the kidneys or the ureters, that can be uh, uh, kind of a, a, a nidus for bacteria to kind of cling on to and make it a lot more easier for people to get um, urinary tract infections in those situations. Of course, anyone who is immunocompromised in general is more prone to bacterial infections, and that includes urinary tract infections. And similarly with poorly controlled diabetes, again, it makes um, them just more prone to bacterial infections in general, and that includes urinary tract infections as well. So UTIs are more common as women get older, and there are a few different reasons for that. So once um, the horm hormones in menopause change, so estrogen decreases significantly uh, in menopause and kind of thereafter. And estrogen is really important in maintaining the balance of good bacteria in the vagina and the vulvar area. And so as that change in hormone happens uh, in menopause, it actually ends up changing the balance of that good and bad bacteria. And what that ends up doing is actually changing the pH or the acidity of the vagina. And so what that then does is change that balance of the good and the bad bacteria. And if there aren't enough good bacteria, it means that bad bacteria or the bacteria that can cause infections are much more likely to be able to grow and to flourish. And that is one of the reasons that makes postmenopausal women a lot more prone to urinary tract infections. 
One of the other things that can happen in menopause is that there can be a steady, and, and with age as well, is that there can be a steady weakening of the pelvic floor and bladder muscles. And that can also increase the risk of um, urinary tract infections as well, just in terms of not emptying the bladder as well um, and not having that kind of stronger floor to keep bacteria from being able to move up as readily. Now, in terms of treatment of UTIs, a lot of it really depends on where along that urinary tract the infection is. So if there is a, an infection that's isolated just to the bladder and there are no other risk factors and uh, it's what we call a simple, uh, simple non-recurrent UTI, so not someone that's getting UTIs frequently and maybe gets one every few years, you, there are some situations where antibiotics may not be necessary. So it's important to kind of talk to your doctor about that and decide if that is something that um, where the evidence uh, would work for you in your specific situations. And in those situations, a lot of times your doctor may say to drink plenty of fluids to kind of keep the urine um, being produced and kind of flushing that bacteria out of the urinary tract. And then using pain medications, because anyone who's had a urinary tract infection knows that it can be very uncomfortable, especially that kind of burning and stinging sensation and that pressure in that lower part of the bladder. And so pain medications like anti-inflammatories can be really helpful as well. Now, for the most part, though, cystitis, so bladder infections and kidney infections always are treated with antibiotics. And so in Alberta in particular, um, there is a really good resource uh, where um, the microbiologists um, have kind of, and the infections of these doctors have come together and made a very nice resource for us to let us, and they kind of monitor what the bacteria are that, um, that typically grow in urinary tract infections. And they let us know what the most likely antibiotic is that's going to work for that bladder infection. And so, of course, it is always important to send off that culture to make sure that that antibiotic is the right one. But thankfully, we have really good guidance in terms of what's um, in terms of different infections um, and different antibiotics for those infections, depending on what they are. Now, when we talk about frequent UTIs, that kind of isn't in that category of a simple non-recurrent UTI. And it actually... Um, adds a level of complexity to uh, the urinary tract infection and kind of changes the way um, that it might need to be managed. So a recurrent UTI is defined as either more than two infections in six months or more than three infections in an entire year. So if you meet either of those thresholds, it's considered a, a recurrent UTI. It's actually fairly common. So up to 27% uh, of women do have recurrent UTIs at some point in their lives. Um, there are lots and lots of different risk factors. So Spermicide use in particular is a risk factor because, again, it can actually um, alter the, the good bacteria in, in the vagina and the vulvar area. And so that can lead to uh, people being more prone to have the bad bacteria or the bacteria that cause infections to start growing and causing that imbalance leading to an infection. Anyone that's had a new sexual partner is at increased risk of, a UTI, of recurrent UTIs. Family history also plays an important role uh, in this. And so if you have um, a first degree relative that has had recurrent UTIs, it makes you more likely to have them as well. And then of course, of course, after menopause, um, in terms of what we talked about, because of those changes in the, the pH of the vagina and the change in the kind of uh, strength of the, the pelvic floor muscles, it can actually make you a lot more prone to recurrent UTIs. So when it comes to recurrent UTIs in particular, there are a few different things that uh, were, there is some evidence that shows that things um, can be done to prevent those recurrent UTIs from happening and from occurring. So in terms of, um, and this specifically applies only to recurrent UTIs. So things, um, anyone who just gets like the odd UTI, that's kind of like a simple non-recurrent UTI, the things that I'm about to talk about don't actually have any evidence for them. This is specifically for recurrent UTIs. So in terms of, um, risk factors. So there can be uh, people who get UTIs related to sexual intercourse. And so if that is something that is common for you, urinating after sex is something that has been shown to prevent, uh, to be able to prevent recurrent UTIs in that specific context. Now, if that doesn't work, one of the other things that you can discuss with your doctor is considering having um, kind of preventative antibiotics after sex in order to prevent that UTI from happening if it's specifically related to sexual intercourse. Now there's all this buzz about cranberry juice. It's definitely a question that I get very often. So um, it's important to know that just drinking plain cranberry juice is not going to be helpful here. So the doses, um, there is kind of no optimal dose of cranberry products, but when we're looking at the doses that have been studied, uh, the typical range is between 500 and 1000 milligrams twice a day 
every day as a preventative um, a preventative method of recurring UTIs. Now that for if we're kind of getting up to 500 to 1000 milligrams a day of kind of the active ingredient in cranberries, you're going to be having uh, well over a liter of cranberry juice every day. And that's has, of course, other health implications as well. And so if it's something um, that you do want to consider getting the pill version of the cranberry supplements and uh, a dose of between 500 and 1000 milligrams twice a day is what uh, has been studied. Again, it is important to talk to your doctor before using this because uh, cranberry products can actually interact with a lot of the other medications that you're on. And so there is a risk benefit. And it's important to talk to your doctor or your pharmacist about that to make sure that you don't have any other interactions with the medications that you're on. If you're thinking about using cranberry products for recurrent UTIs. Again, I want to reiterate. So if you're someone that does not get frequent UTIs, cranberry products don't work. The, the evidence is specifically for recurrent UTIs and that evidence is with that higher dose. And so drinking cranberry juice isn't really what's going to win here. It's going to be using uh, cranberry supplements. In terms of um, postmenopausal women who are at increased risk of uh, urinary tract infections, there's very good evidence to show that using topical or vaginal estrogen will help decrease the risk of or decrease the amount of UTIs that you're having and help prevent those recurrent UTIs. In general, Having an increased fluid intake will help also uh, reduce the risk of recurrent UTIs because it will kind of, I mean, for lack of a, um, a scientific way of explaining it, if we just think about it, we're trying to kind of continue to flush things out and flush the bacteria through that might be trying to um, uh, grow in that urinary tract and increasing the fluid intake has been shown to reduce recurrent UTIs. Avoiding spermicides, if that's something that is a potential risk factor for you, avoiding spermicides can also help uh, to reduce the recurrence of UTIs. And then there is another product uh, called d manos and that needs to be done in consultation with either your urologist or your urogynecologist, your gynecologist. Now, this is um, basically um, a sugar type molecule that can be taken as a pill. And the ideas um, and the evidence uh, around it uh, kind of shows that it allow it doesn't allow the bacteria to bind to the wall of the bladder. And so in order to have an infection, that bacteria has to kind of bind to the wall of the bladder and then cause that localized infection around that wall of the bladder. And so this um, medication or supplement can actually stop that binding from happening. And so it's an, an important one to discuss with your urologist or your gynecologist to see if that's something that might be helpful for you as well. So pregnancy is a very specific and special category here because there is an increased risk of complications of bladder infections in pregnancy. So in particular, pregnancy can actually increase the risk of kidney infection. Um, kidney infections can be quite serious in pregnancy and can lead to uh, concerns um, with the fetus. Even bladder infections early in pregnancy can uh, slightly increase the risk of miscarriage as well. And so it's really important um, that pregnant people who have even bladder infections get treated quite, uh, um, uh, quite quickly and not let the symptoms linger. Now, this is the one situation where bacteria in the urine without symptoms is actually taken more seriously. So if you remember from the first uh, couple of slides where I kind of defined what a urinary tract infection is, I said that it was bacteria in the ur urine with coinciding symptoms, and that's how a urinary tract infection is diagnosed. The one exception to this is in pregnant people. And the reason for that is because even um, bacteria without symptoms in a pregnant person is a lot more likely to turn into a symptomatic infection. And then there are complications that come with that. And so anyone who is pregnant that has bacteria growing in their urine, so you can see that in the, in the culture that we send off, they are always treated with antibiotics for that, uh, for that bacteria in their urine, even if they don't have symptoms of a, of a bladder infection or a, a kidney infection. If these are not treated, there can be adverse outcomes. So I mentioned, um, you know, uh, the increased risk of miscarriage of bladder infections, but there is also an increased risk of preterm birth, especially with kidney infections. Um, there's an increased risk of low birth weight. And there's also just a generalized increased risk of um, mortality for mom and fetus with kidney infections in particular. So we take these very, very seriously in pregnant patients and make sure that we treat those uh, quickly and aggressively as well. So we've talked all about UTIs, but there are actually quite a few things um, that can mimic UTI symptoms. So if you're someone that has the symptoms that we've talked about, so things like burning when you pee, um, kind of having to pee more frequently, needing to get to the bathroom really frequently, having that kind of 
pressure around your bladder. And if your tests end up being negative, so if you get a urine test and it doesn't show any evidence of those markers that we look for uh, look to, to diagnose a urinary tract infection, or if there are no bacteria that grow, your doctor will consider these other things and, and may test for these other things as well that can kind of mimic uh, a UTI as well. So a yeast infection is something that your doctor can test for, and it can certainly mimic the, those symptoms of a urinary tract infection. Something called bacterial vaginosis. And so what that is, is basically... Um, an overgrowth uh, or an imbalance in the bacteria that are in your um, vagina and vulvar area that can lead to very similar symptoms. Something called urethritis, which is just um, a medical way of saying uh, kind of irritation and inflammation of the urethra without a coinciding bacterial infection. And that can be caused by um, different medications. It can be caused by different products that people may be using uh, to um, use in their vulvar area. Uh, sexually transmitted infections as well can very much mimic uh, urinary tract infections. Pelvic inflammatory disease, which is uh, usually caused by sexually transmitted infections, can uh, mimic UTIs as well. And then something called the urogenital syndrome of menopause. And essentially, um, it's, again, a kind of a fancy medical way of describing the kind of um, uh, changes that happen in uh, the menopausal period with the decreased estrogen, where the skin around the vulvar area can be more thin, it can be more dry, and it can certainly mimic those symptoms of a urinary tract infection in postmenopausal women as well. So my, my um, kind of shtick is always, in the end, when should you see a doctor? I, you know, I like to educate the public on all these different um, pieces of information and, uh, about the different things that I talk about, but I always end with when is it important to see a doctor or go to the emergency department, uh, because of course I am an eMERGE doc, so it's a, um, an important piece of information that I want to get out there as well. So it's important to see a doctor if you do have symptoms of bladder infection, because um, it's important to discuss with them whether you should have antibiotics or not, whether you need to get testing or not. And if you're someone that ends up having frequent uh, UTIs or recurrent UTIs, what sort of options there are available for you that are safest for you to try to prevent those recurrent UTIs from occurring again. If you have any sort of symptoms of bladder infection that could have spread beyond the bladder, so for thinking about things like a kidney infection, so if you have that back pain, a fever, nausea or vomiting, feeling generally unwell, um, that, that um, along with the symptoms of a bladder infection, that would be a reason to see a doctor. And I would say, actually, that's a reason to come into the emergency department because bladder infections are always treated with IV antibiotics. And that's something you can only get in the hospital. If you notice any blood in the urine. Now, although that can be a sign of a urinary tract infection, it can also be a sign of a kidney stone or some other, um, some other uh, lesion or pathology that might be along that, uh, that urinary tract. So that's definitely an important reason to see a doctor. Any sort of pain around those kidneys, so whether it's in the context of um, a bladder infection or a kidney infection or otherwise, if you have any sort of pain around, around the kidney area, it's important to see a doctor then. If you're being treated with, a, uh, with an antibiotic or um, if you're kind of have been advised to use an antibiotic sparing uh, kind of treatment with, with fluids um, and pain medication, if at any point your symptoms are getting worse, it's really important to see your doctor because that may mean that you either need antibiotics if you weren't on them before, or it may mean that you're not on the right antibiotics for the infection that you have. And then of course, if symptoms either persist or come back after treatment, it's another reason to see a doctor right away. So that's all I have for you today. Um, but I'm really excited to hear the questions and uh, the discussion uh, around this topic. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Mazzani. Um, my name is Brianna Botsford. I'm a proud supporter of the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society, and I'll just be facilitating the Q&A part of this evening. Uh, we have received uh, some great questions. Um, and again, thank you so much, Dr. Mazzani, for all that great information. Um, please, folks, go ahead and pop any questions that you may have in the chat, and I will do my best to get through all of them. Um, one of the early questions that came in was about uh, the, uh, uh, is there some kind of nerve connection uh, between bladder and kidneys and arm and neck pain? This individual was um, identifying that they get some uh, pain during their, and pins and needles in their neck and arm uh, when they have a urinary tract infection. So, um, 
the body can do interesting things, right? So there are lots of different um, connections in the body in terms of nerves, but also something that we call referred pain. So uh, the example that I always like to give is brain freeze. So when you have something cold hit the back of your throat, you actually get a headache. And so um, what that is, what's happening in that situation is that the, the signals are essentially getting crossed in your brain. And it's what's, what's being perceived as cold in, in the back of your throat. The signal is being sent to your brain that you're actually having pain in your head. And so um, there are lots of different weird connections like that in the body. And so um, with, the, with the urinary tract in particular, it is kind of part of what we call the parasympathetic nervous system. And so that can lead to sometimes some weird aches and pains in different parts of the body. And so um, although I don't know the specific connection, uh, that's kind of the just kind of reasoning through it, um, what probably makes the most sense. Yes, referral pain. And I love the analogy of brain freeze, how you get that headache, even though like that Slurpee was nowhere near my brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, another question that came in was about pessaries. Um, do pessaries for uterine or bladder prolapse uh, increase the risk for urinary tract infections? So that's kind of a tricky one because it. Um, I, I'm going to say yes and no. So on the one hand, um, uh, a weaker pelvic floor and kind of having um, the bladder uh, kind of collapse through that pelvic floor uh, can lead to an increased risk of urinary tract infections because the bladder is not emptying as readily. And that's, that's going to occur in postmenopausal women. So a pessary kind of helps to mitigate that risk. Um, that being said, if a pessary is not put in properly um, or is causing kind of issues, there can be then inadvertently issues with um with the pessary being there and the bladder not emptying properly either and so it's it's kind of this balance where where um it could help with urinary tract infections but it could potentially increase the risk of them as well and so that's definitely a discussion to have with your um, family doctor or the or the gynecologist that put that pessary in so that balance between pelvic floor function is just really important when we're considering mm -hmm. the risk for um urinary tract infections um and then the next question that came in uh, was also kind of related to postmenopause. Um, as an elder, uh, how does one keep pH balance in the vagina to support health and prevent urinary tract infections? And I think you mentioned a couple of things, but maybe we can just revisit that. Yeah. So one of the things uh, that's most important in postmenopausal women for preventing recurrent UTIs is using vaginal estrogen because it can help increase that estrogen and then try to rebalance that pH because one of the reasons that that pH becomes imbalanced in menopause is that because that estrogen goes down. There have been some studies looking at probiotics for recurrent UTIs, but the um, there hasn't really been any definitive evidence one way or the other in terms of the prevention of UTIs in, in kind of helping to reestablish that vaginal um, pH. Uh, there's little harm in probiotics though. And so if it's something that you want to try and take and you find that it works for you, I don't think that that's a big deal either. So a uh, tick in the column for vaginal estrogen and potentially probiotics. And, and a following question from someone else was about chronic urinary tract infections that they've had for about 30 plus years. And this person's in their 70s. Um, and uh, there's a couple points in here that might be relevant. One about um, basically they've been prescribed many different types of antibiotics, depending on what culture, show, what shows up in their urine culture. Um, and then... Um, they are feeling concerned over that long-term um, antibiotic use. Um, there is a history of breast cancer in this patient and um, they are clear surgery, radiation, uh, it's been two years. Um, a concern is that the there, the physician doesn't seem to think that Premarin is an option. Um, there, and I think I wanted to bring this question up following the vaginal estrogen um, comment because um do you what do we think about vaginal estrogen in patients that have a history of breast cancer even like post-treatment obviously very individual and sort of risk benefit um assessment but what what feedback would you have for that person yeah so that's a tricky one um so i would recommend if they're not like i don't know if the doctor that they're mentioning there is a family doctor versus a specialist or a gynecologist so in in kind of these nuanced situations where especially with someone who uh, is postmenopausal 
has that cancer history um, and has that history of recurring UTIs, which, I mean, that sounds terrible. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, it's it's uh, definitely asking your family doctor to refer you to a urogynecologist in particular would be really helpful because they can talk to you about different um, options kind of beyond what I've mentioned because they are the specialists in that area uh, to look at what might work for you on an individual basis. And I think that's fantastic, like to hear that specialty, right? Like urogynecology versus gynecology versus general practitioner and sort of working through that referral system to try and get to a conversation about risks and benefits. Awesome. And thank you folks for sharing your stories. We really appreciate the, the your um, having these great conversations between us. Um, and another question about bladder slings. So do we know um, or do we think if uh, bladder slings may have a lifespan um, as it gets old, like 20 years plus, could that increase the risk of urinary tract infections? Kind of another pelvic floor question for you. Yeah, uh, that is one that I don't know the answer to. So um, unfortunately, I mean, like, I, I uh, am happy to always say when I don't know the answer to something. So that's one that it's not my area of expertise. So I don't know the answer to that one. But definitely would recommend talking to your gynecologist or your surgeon that did the surgery to talk about that. Excellent. Uh, lots of love for the D Manos and clarification questions about that, um, just the name of that product. So that came up a little bit. Um, and uh, patients commenting about uh, estrogen therapy um, seeming to be helping with urinary tract infection prevention. Uh, another comment about vaginal probiotics. So when you were talking about probiotics, I think we were talking about oral probiotics. This is a question about vaginal probiotics. So suppositories, do we think those might help a urinary tract infection? So the studies that I've looked at have specifically looked at oral probiotics where the evidence is mm -hmm. mixed. Um, I'm not aware of too much in terms of vaginal probiotics. So if you are going to use um, a probiotic, I, I would say use an oral one because that's where the studies have been done um, and have shown potential benefit of preventing recurrent UTIs. Fantastic. Um, a question about teenage girls. So I think this is switching gears a little bit here. So how common is it for teenage girls who are not sexually active to get a urinary tract infection? How concerned should a parent be if a daughter in their teens has a urinary tract infection? Um, not concerned. Like females are just so prone to having UTIs, whether they're sexually active or not. It's just because of that, sh like, you know, that sh tiny short little urethra that we have. Um, it just mm. makes us so much more prone to uh, UTIs. Now, when we talk about like uh, teenagers, probably not so much, but when, you know, when we talk about like young uh, kids, for example, hygiene becomes really important in terms of that, like, you know, wipe from front to back um, because of the most common bacteria coming from the bum. And so um, you know, looking at things like that as a potential cause uh, of UTIs in young females, but also like there doesn't even necessarily have to be any risk factors because it's um, females are just uh, unlucky in this way and many other ways of, of just being more prone because of the of simply because of anatomy. Yes, that uh, proximity and short urethra plays plays a role in that risk factor. So we don't need to be too concerned. We know we are going to be more prone than, than males. Um, the only thing I would add to that, oh, sorry, the only thing I would add to that um, is if it's, I mean, if, if there are recurrent UTIs, and that would definitely be a reason to see a doctor just so you can talk about potential like causes and preventative measures going forward too. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, another question here is, if a burning sensation persists after a urinary tract infection is treated, is this cause for concern? Also have had yeast infections um, that were treated. Why is there still burning sensations? Mm -hmm. So um, if you guys remember that last, uh, one of the last slides that I had in terms of like mimics of UTIs, there could be a couple of different reasons for this. One could be that the urinary tract infection is not treated adequately. Um, it may have been that the, you know, the antibiotic wasn't the correct one uh, in terms of the culture. Cause like anytime we're treating any bacterial infection as doctors, we're always doing our best guess, right? Cause we don't have the culture results right away. And so what we're doing is relying on um, what we call antibiotograms, which um, look at the most common bacteria and tell us what um, the most um, suitable antibiotic would be for that. But that's not hundred percent accurate all the time. And oftentimes uh, the culture uh, is what's going to be important um, in that situation. And so if you're someone that has 
persistent symptoms after the antibiotic course is done and you've completed the entire thing as, uh, as kind of prescribed and directed, that's a reason to go back to your doctor to see if, um, if you may not have, if that antibiotic wasn't the right one for your bladder infection. The other thing to consider is whether there was something else going on that it, where it wasn't a bladder infection, right? Like, could this have been a yeast infection or bacterial vaginosis or like irritation from um, products that you're using? Uh, in STI, like there are lots of different other reasons to, to have that burning as well. And so if it persists after a course of antibiotics, it's important to follow up with your doctor again to make sure um, that there isn't something else that might be causing your symptoms. Awesome. Yeah, there's just that need for follow up care if your symptoms haven't fully resolved and making sure that we're getting the right treatment for the right patient. Um, okay, I think this is an interesting question about um, regarding um, different washes or rinses um, with the pH of the vagina vulva being, um, you know, necessarily regulated, do we need to have uh, washes, rinses, or solutions to help regulate that pH? Um, this individual is using soap twice a day, but having recurrent infections and is also on biologic drugs. Okay, so there's a couple of things there. So one, uh, I don't think you should use anything to kind of um, rinse your vulva or vaginal area. I actually have like some content on this on my Instagram channel if anybody wants to go check that out. So <clears throat> Brian, I see you nodding your head because you've probably seen it. So um, sure have. The, I'm a yeah, fan. Yeah, the only thing that you need to, to kind of clean, um, I'm going to take a step back. The vagina and the vulva are self-cleaning. So um I'll take a little bit of a tangent. The patriarchy has told us that this is not a clean area and that we need products to clean it. I do not believe in that. And the evidence has shown that that is not actually what's needed. Um, so the vagina and the vulva are self-cleaning. All you need to do to uh, um, kind of have good hygiene down there is use plain water and your fingers. That's it. Like just, and like not inside, just like kind of separate the vulva or lips and just use like, uh, like, plain water. That's it. So using soap is not necessary. And in fact, using soaps can actually potentially um, kill the good bacteria that are there. Using things like douches will, can also like alter the, the um, kind of balance of the good bacteria. So I recommend, uh, and, and gynecologists as well recommend like not using products like that. They're, um, they're a marketing tactic uh, to kind of prey on the vulnerabilities of women. Uh, they're not useful. They're not, and they're not needed. All you need is water. Now, in terms of the, I mean, like, so that could be a cause of having ongoing UTIs. And then the biologic is something that can be immunocompromising, right? So that's another risk factor that's there that could make um, someone more prone to recurrent urinary tract infections as well. It's important to talk to your doctor about that. Yes. And I think uh, my biggest uh, uh, wake up call moment was when I saw an advertisement for some kind of vaginal wash that was going to make you smell like a cupcake. And I really don't think that we need to be smelling like cupcakes um, in, in that area or putting those kinds of things there. So, um, mm -hmm. and, and yes, you do have some fantastic content on your, on your Instagram uh, about this topic. So definitely check that out, everyone. Um, okay, let's find some more. So uh, a question about cystoscopy. So with recurrent UTIs, um, some tests showing bacteria in this individual, some tests coming up clear. Um, what would be the potential benefit of having a cystoscopy? Um, would that detect what is, why this is happening for an individual? Yeah, so a cystoscopy is done by uh, a urologist. And basically what that is, is it's a camera that goes up the urethra and looks around at the bladder. And so what it can look for is any sort of abnormalities on the bladder wall, um, if there's any sort of um, like irritation, often biopsies are taken as well to kind of uh, get to the underlying cause of symptoms. Um, and so that's where cystoscopies come in. So if it's someone that's having like recurrent symptoms that aren't going away or not, uh, not kind of treated with the usual things, um, if it's someone that's having kind of persistent blood in their urine, for example, like those would be reasons to have a cystoscopy and be referred to a urologist to do that. Okay, so that would uh, be just like an additional investigation that could be mm -hmm. done for those situations. A um, little bit back to the pelvic floor sort of questions here. Um, can you comment on, I, 
I think this is saying current, it's either concurrent or current, um, pelvic floor treatment being widely advertised on TV. I, I think this is just an important uh, question I can rephrase a little bit as far as, do we think that there may be benefits of pelvic floor therapy, physiotherapy, those kinds of things in the prevention of urinary tract infections? Yeah, so um, pelvic floor therapy is, a, is um, pretty broad. I would say if you're seeing something advertised on TV, proceed with caution. That's just my uh, general bias. Like if it's something that your doctor is talking to you about, then I think it's important to consider. There is reasonable evidence for pelvic floor physiotherapy, um, you know, kind of in the postpartum period and, and uh, maybe sometimes in the perimenopausal period. Um, you know, we, we uh, oftentimes these um, like pelvic floor or vaginal rejuvenation procedures uh, and things mm. like lasers, for example, like don't have any good evidence behind them. So I would be weary of something that's being advertised to you um, and, and talk to your doctor first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a broad, like pelvic floor therapy. There's a lot of different um, things that come to mind. And so being uh, cautious uh, and like a critical consumer, I mm -hmm. suppose, and also definitely speaking to your healthcare provider to determine mm -hmm. if this is something that may be right for you or not. For sure. Um, there, oh, someone is asking what your Instagram channel is. So maybe you can just uh, tell yeah, us I'll your, just put your it, Instagram it's, handle. Uh, it's at Dr. Shazma Mathani. I'll just put the handle in the chat right now. So fantastic mm -hmm. um a little bit back to the um vaginal estrogen again um there's a couple comments i'm going to try and pull these both together um one is just about increasing dosage of um vagifem i think it was vagifem anyways um yeah vagifem uh to like twice per week um is that you know increasing a risk of stroke um and then another question um similar you know, about using vaginal estrogen when on um, blood thinners, because there is this concept or this idea that estrogen can cause um, uh, potential blood clots or increase the risk of blood clots. Yeah, so um, if if you're in, a, so topical estrogen has a lower risk than kind of oral estrogen, but the risk is not zero. So if you're mm -hmm. someone that's taking vaginal estrogen or considering taking it, it's like a really important, to, like, cause I can't, I can't answer individual questions like that, but it's really important yeah. to have those conversations with your doctor um, who knows your history the best and kind of knows what your risk factors are. And like everything in medicine is kind of weighing a risk and benefit. Even when I prescribe blood thinners for someone, mm -hmm. it's always a discussion of having like what the, cause every, everything has a risk and everything has a benefit. And so the question is always like, which one is more like, is the risk more, is the benefit more? And then that helps us kind of like have that shared decision-making with our patients and decide uh, what, what kind of treatment options are going to be best for them. Yes. I, I think that's so important, like the shared decision making. I think a lot of these questions that are coming in that are very like individual and personalized are are coming from that place of wanting to have a shared decision making, mm -hmm. shared decision making process. And I think sometimes that can feel hard um, to to access. So really like being your own advocate and asking these questions and that's why we hold these talks so that people can learn how to ask questions um, mm -hmm. and understand some of the potential risks and benefits and ask those questions directly to their physician so that they can make individualized choices for sure and even like what what types of questions to ask so like maybe this is the first time you're learning about something like d manos or the first time that you're learning that, you know, vaginal estrogen might be something that's beneficial. And so being able to have those conversations with your doctor and take that information to them to see if it's right for you. Yes, exactly. Um, okay. One other thing that I saw, sorry, I'm just trying to find the question that I, that I, uh, that I saw that I thought was I mean, these are all such fantastic questions. Thank you for, for everyone who's asking questions and for everybody who's staying on to, to listen to these fantastic answers. Um, okay, so this question was about um, urinary tract infections leading to endometriitis. So could endometriitis, so an infection in the uterus lead to um, a urinary tract infection or a urinary tract infection lead to endometriitis? And I think that's a, a good like anatomy clarification and, mm -hmm. and explanation. 
For sure. So um, endometritis is kind of um, an infection of the of the uterus. Um, and so the most common situations that we see that in are in the in the postpartum period um, or after any sort of um, instrumentation of, of the uterus. So like if someone's had a DNC, for example, um, had any sort of like bio, like an endometrial biopsy as well. And the, and the reason for that is that under normal circumstances, the cervix is a pretty tightly closed structure. So that's what's at the bottom of the uterus. Um, there's mm-hmm. like a mucus, like the, there's mucus that's there. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty um, close to the outside world. And unless there's set, like a, a way for bacteria to be introduced there with an instrument or with, you know, the, the cervix opening um, with a vaginal delivery, that's what's going to increase the risk of um, that bacteria going up into the uterus and, and causing that infection. So um, as far as I know, there's not any sort of association between a urinary tract infection and um, uh, endometritis. And in fact, like when you do have a urinary tract infection, because that cervix is like a, a tightly closed structure, there isn't really any risk of that bacteria traveling up to the uterus. Okay, awesome. So it's more a close, like it's not a closed system, but it's separate. It's a separate yeah, system. Yeah, it's separate. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this is the question I was looking for. So um, you had mentioned um, there is mental confusion that is sometimes a, um, a, a symptom of a urinary tract infection, specifically in seniors. Can you explain the mechanism? Why does that happen? Yeah, so um, seniors, as, as people get older and um, in particular, like start having frailty, things can start presenting in very different ways. And, and a lot of that is because... Um, the, the, you know, for lack of a better way to explain it, that that fine balance is just so much finer. And so anything that kind of throws off um, that equilibrium that's in in a frail senior's body can immediately lead to uh, things like what we call delirium or confusion. Um, we know that one of the most common causes of delirium in an elderly frail person is a urinary tract infection. So if somebody, if there's an elderly person that comes in confused into my emergency department, the first thing I do is go searching for a urinary tract infection because it's one of the most common causes. Um, in terms of the mechanism, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, it's because that that equilibrium is thrown off. But the other other thing is that um, older, uh, elderly people are just also a lot more prone to kidney infections. And once we get to kidney infections, we can start having more systemic effects and potentially that spreading of bacteria in the blood, which, which can also cause people to get pretty sick and confused. And so, uh, those are two potential reasons for that. It's, it's pretty common. That's so interesting. I would be so I mean, your job must just be wild. I can't even imagine. So um, that would be such a such an interesting, you know, situation to be able to um, differentiate that quite quickly. Um, A couple other questions that I missed. Um, Would a gynecologist test for BV if a urinary tract infection is ruled out? So yeah, usually they would if there's if a urinary like after, you know, the culture comes back and the urine comes back and someone's still having symptoms. And that's when um, either a family doctor or a gynecologist would start looking for other causes for the symptoms that a patient is having. And that would include things like tests, like doing a pelvic exam, looking for like a yeast infection, uh, BV, so bacterial vaginosis, looking for STIs, those sorts of things. Awesome. Thank you. Um, One other one that came in was about lubricants. So um, lubricants, uh, vaginal lubricants for um, intercourse or sexual activity, could those contribute to the risk of urinary tract infections? And then another similar question, uh, using condoms uh, or using condoms when using toys, uh, can those potentially increase risk of urinary tract infections? not in and of themselves, um, separate from like just sexual sexual intercourse with a new partner being a potential risk factor or some people being more prone to um, UTIs with, with any sort of like kind of vaginal penetration or intercourse. Uh, mm-hmm. If there's, of course, uh, if there's a spermicide being used and then that definitely does increase the risk of urinary tract infection, so. Right. And did I know now that you're not sharing your slides, you can also see all of these great questions coming in. Were there any that I missed that you wanted to address that you saw? Yeah, there's one that I see here asking whether a low back pain is a typical symptom of a bladder infection. Uh, um, yes. That is what one that I didn't talk about, but absolutely yes. So like in addition to kind of having that lower pelvic pain in the front, you can actually have like some people tend to have low back pain um, with with just a bladder infection, not necessarily a kidney infection. So the kidney pain is much higher up. Um, but that low back pain can come along with just a simple bladder infection too. 
And then one more came in about pure Pyridium, uh, which is not available in Canada. Um, Tylenol Advil doesn't seem to be nearly as effective. I'm not familiar with this medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, this was before my time, but I've certainly learned about it. So, and it's still available in the US. So Pyridium is a medication that basically uh, kind of concentrates in the bladder, like uh, you take it orally and it concentrates in the bladder. And it's basically like a, a local bladder anesthetic pain medication. And uh, my understanding in talking to people is that uh, it's it, it works wonders when it's used. The, the problem is, is that it has a pretty significant um, uh, toxic side effect that, that's, uh, that can be pretty concerning that even when it's used at therapeutic doses, it can cause, um, uh, I'm not gonna get into the toxicology of it, but there's like a very specific uh, negative consequence of it that can be life-threatening even when used in therapeutic doses. And so, uh, that's why it ended up being taken away in Canada by Health Canada because of that, um, because of that concern. But every so, time I hear about it, people miss it. So, yeah. Um, another question about sugar and, and bacteria. Does sugar feed the bacteria in the blood or a kidney? And I think maybe that also lends itself to the idea of top, type 2 diabetes or even diabetes and increase the risk of infection. Yeah, so um, there are some like theories as to why uh, bladder infections or like even things like yeast infections are more common in people with diabetes. There are some theories that it could be because, um, you know, bacteria like sugar, but probably the more likely cause is that diabetes doesn't affect your immune system and does essentially make you immunocompromised. And that's probably the more mm -hmm. likely reason. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, there's lots. Did you see any others? Sorry, I don't want to cut you yeah, off. Yeah, I'm just like kind of skimming through here to see if there's anything else that um, kind of pops up here. No, I think you, you hit most of them there. Well, thank you so, so much. Um, thank you. Just from the bottom of my heart for participating in this evening. Um, we, uh, if anybody here would like to become a monthly donor, consider uh, supporting the Women's Society. Um, you will receive links uh, in the email that you use to access this uh, webinar tonight, but also follow up with the survey. Um, and uh, thank you to all of those of you who have already donated to the Lewis Hole Hospital Women's Society. We appreciate and cherish every single one of our regular donors, but also those of you that submitted donations with your registration. Thank you so much. You're really having an impact on uh, the women uh, in our province and beyond. Um, last but not least, thank you so much to Alberta Blue Cross for sponsoring these talks and allowing us to continue with this really important series. Um, and don't forget everyone, you will get a feedback survey um, to fill in. And if you do, you will be entered to win a $25 gift card courtesy of Alberta Blue Cross. So if you get an email from Alberta Blue Cross saying you won, it's not a scam. You actually probably won. Um, so make sure you go ahead and fill in those feedback surveys. We actually read every single one of them and we take your feedback into account to do our absolute best to bring topics and speakers um, that you're excited about um and you're engaged with um our next uh between us chat uh will be held in november stay tuned for more information about that dr Muthani. it was so great to chat with you thank you so much for being uh our presenter this evening and uh just for all of that wonderful information and for caring so much for all of the questions and the stories that we received tonight thank you for being with us tonight this was so great. Thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. Well, have a great evening, everyone.